We have special guests with us right now. It's Peter Schiff. He's an investment broker, author, and financial commentator who makes frequent appearances as a guest on CNBC, Fox Business Channel, and Bloomberg Television. He also hosts The Peter Schiff Show. On the radio, Schiff is also the CEO and Chief Global Strategist of Euro-Pacific Capital, Inc., and CEO of Euro-Pacific Precious Metals. Peter, welcome to the show. Hey, Jimmy. Thanks for having me on. Just a, a couple of notes. First of all, Euro-Pacific Precious Metals, years ago, uh, the name was changed to Schiff Gold. And uh, so that's a new name of that company. And it's now owned by a company called Gold Money. But I do work uh, very closely oh, okay. uh, with them. Uh, and so for people who want to buy gold and silver, that's the best place to do it. Uh, also, though, yeah, you know, I'm no longer a guest on CNBC or Bloomberg. Bloomberg banned me over <laughs> 10 years ago. I, I, I used to do Bloomberg all the time. I used to even guest host. But uh, I got too many predictions right for Bloomberg, so they stopped having me on. Uh, CNBC banned me probably for the same reason, maybe about, I don't know, four years ago. So they had me on a little bit longer, but then eventually decided uh, that they didn't want the truth uh, being spoken on their network. So I still do do Fox Business, though, Fox News. Uh, in fact, I was on Fox News last night with um, Tucker Carlson. Uh, and I do a lot of other uh, international uh, shows, and I do, of course, a lot of podcasts. But the mainstream media, by and large, doesn't have me on. You know, I used to go on CNN, uh, MSNBC. There are a lot of other networks that used to invite me on that no longer invite me. Well, uh I became aware. I mean, I've known about you. I've seen you on all those shows, right? I watch those shows sometimes. Um, not that I know anything about investing or money or anything, which I don't. Uh, but I, I did see a video of you back in, I think, in 2004. Maybe it was 2006. But you were predicting the how the crash of the Wall Street, the housing bubble. And you were onto that before anybody else. And yeah, well, you might have seen the the original Peter Schiff was right video that I guess a fan of mine put together back in 2008. Uh, that was a compilation of a lot of my appearances, mostly on Fox Business, but some on CNBC, where I was arguing with the other pundits because they were all convinced that everything was great. And I was trying to persuade them that it wasn't, that we're in a bubble, uh, that there was a housing bubble, that it was going to pop, that it was going to take down the economy, that we were going to have a financial crisis. So, uh, and they were all laughing at me. And then, of course, when I was right, uh, this video got a lot of, you know, a lot of views because everybody looked pretty foolish. And I was the only one who, you know, got it right. But, you know, the interesting thing is the same people who were saying everything was great back in 2006 and seven and uh, middle 2008, they're the same guys that are saying everything is great now. I mean, they're the same guys that are saying we have this great economy, uh, don't worry about inflation, the Fed's gonna get rid of it. In fact, these were the same people who said there was no inflation to worry about. And they believed the Federal Reserve when they said it's transitory, just like they believed the Fed when they said, don't worry about the housing market, don't worry about subprime, it's contained. The Fed always lies about the strength of the U.S. economy. In fact, uh, President uh, uh, Biden was on television today telling Americans that, you know, we're fighting inflation from a position of strength when America has never been more weak, especially to fight inflation. Because to fight inflation, we need much higher interest rates that we can't afford to pay because we have so much debt. And in order to fight inflation, the Federal Reserve is going to have to shrink the money supply dramatically, which would require significant tax cut, tax hikes rather, uh, on the middle class or significant reductions in spending, including on entitlements like Social Security and Medicare. So unless the government is willing to do some combination of those things, there, you know, we can't fight inflation because we can't shrink the money supply. So... Now I saw another video of you. I think it's from 2015 and you're at the Hillsdale College and you're giving a speech and you're predicting this inflation that we're going through right now. So it seems yeah. like you have a knack for seeing things coming. And so let me just play this this little short little blurb from you giving that speech. I think this was from 2015. And so here it comes. Indeed, with their propaganda effort to convince everybody that inflation is a good thing and their job is to create it. Right? How's that for a 180, right? Because people used to say, oh, the Federal Reserve is here to fight inflation. Now they're here to create inflation. 
to fight the absence of inflation. Right? They used to say, we, wanna, we want price stability. Well, price stability means no inflation. Now they've redefined price stability to prices rising by at least 2% a year. And if they're not rising by at least that much, we have to take decisive action to make sure that prices go up. Because somehow if prices don't go up, right, then we're gonna, the economy is going to implode into some kind of vortex. Right? And so this, 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 this is the, the propaganda effort that the Federal Reserve has been able to successfully you know, indoctrinate almost the entire world at this point into believing that a rising cost of living is an economic necessity. That somehow if the cost of living were to go down, that we would all suffer as a result of that. Now, why, what, so why, where did they come up with that? So why, what makes them think that about inflation? Now, I know they've kept it, you know, interest rates artificially low, but so tell me, can you explain that to me? Why the Fed would, would want inflation? Well, first of all, they want inflation, but they don't want to level with the public as to why they want it. So they had to come up with a lie. And the lie that they came up with was that we needed more inflation, that we just didn't have enough because somehow if the cost of living isn't going up, the economy is going to crash, right? They said that prices have to go up according to their logic. And again, I don't think they actually believe this because you know, it's so ridiculous. How could anybody be dumb enough to believe it? Although apparently a lot of people do. They said that if prices aren't going up, people won't buy stuff. Like if, if, if you think that a price is going to go down, you just will not buy. You'll just wait for the price to go down indefinitely and you'll just never buy. Right? You'll just go hungry. You won't buy it. You know, you'll sit at home. You'll, you won't travel. You won't buy any consumer electronics. You'll just sit there in perpetuity waiting for a better deal, which is, is so ridiculous. Uh, people buy stuff when they need it. And if they don't buy it, it's because they can't afford it. And if you can't afford it, the only way to afford it is to let the price go down, right? I mean, if, if you go back and look at the first cell phones, how many Americans bought those cell phones that Gordon Gecko had? You know, those, you know, that big brick thing that he taught. Very few pe people bought them. It wasn't because people didn't want them. I mean, everybody would have took one if, you know, you got it for free. But they didn't want to spend two or $3,000, which was a lot more money back in 1980, than it is today. And if you wanted to use the phone, it was like, you know, a dollar a minute just to make a phone call or whatever. So most people couldn't afford it. But the reason that everybody has a cell phone today is because the price came down. The idea that we need prices to go up to get people to buy stuff is complete nonsense. So the government came up with this lie to try to, you know, create some cover for inflation. But the real reason that the Federal Reserve and every central bank, it's not just the Fed is the only central bank that's been lying to the public about a need for more inflation. They did it for a number of reasons. One, by printing all this money, they were able to push up the value of stocks, the value of real estate. So everybody felt richer because now their stock portfolio was up or their house was worth more. But it also enabled more borrowing. They kept interest rates artificially low, supposedly to fight the absence of inflation, but really they wanted to make it easier for Americans to go deeper into debt. Why? Because our whole economy is based on debt. It's based on borrowing money and spending it, borrowing money and buying stocks with it or real estate. So they had to keep the cost of debt low enough for Americans to afford it. So they had to create this pretense for doing it. And that was, we don't have enough inflation. We've got to fight the, the absence of inflation, the specter of deflation. And of course, the other reason to create all this inflation was because the U.S. government runs enormous budget deficits. They don't have the guts to tax the American public sufficiently to pay for the programs they've promised the American public. Uh, and, and so they count on the Federal Reserve to print the difference. And so the government is actually financing its spending through inflation. And so the Federal Reserve, in order to create a pretext for monetizing government debt, <clears throat> said that, well, we need more inflation. Well, now we've got all the inflation in spades. We now are beginning to suffer the consequences of 10 or 20 years of inflationary monetary policy. Now, that all culminated with COVID. I mean, that was the worst possible thing they could have done. And that was kind of the end of it, where they just threw caution to the wind and they printed money like crazy. 
And at the same time, Americans stopped working. And not just Americans, people all around the world didn't go to work. They weren't producing stuff. We should have you know, subtracted the money supply because if supply was going down, we needed less demand. But those idiots in Washington wanted to stimulate demand. At the same time, they were stifling su supply. They were telling people, don't go to work, don't produce anything, but we're going to print a bunch of money for you to go out and buy stuff. Buy what? People aren't making anything. That's why we have supply shortages, because we have a surplus of money. And, and so this is just the beginning. Uh, we're going to be suffering inflation, not just for years, but for decades. Uh, because initially, the inflation was in the financial assets, and everybody liked that. Stocks went up, real estate went up, but that's gone. Now it's in consumer goods. Now it's the supermarket where you're going to see the inflation, the gas station. Everything's going to get more expensive every single year. Huge price increases, you know, 10%, 15%, 20%. The cost of living is going to explode. And all of this is the cost of government because government is so much bigger now than it used to be, but we haven't been asked to pay for it with taxes. There's no free lunch. You don't get government for nothing. The cost of government is going to be paid through inflation. So I want to, here's another part of your speech uh, that you gave to Hillsdale College, and you make a prediction. Let's, so let's listen. All this was from the Fed. And I think because of the Fed, the United States today is on the verge of the biggest economic catastrophe in the history of the country. And, you know, if you thought the 2008 financial crisis was bad, that's nothing compared to what's coming. That was just the warm up, right? The main event is still coming. And because of what the Federal Reserve did in the aftermath of that crisis to make all the problems that caused the crisis worse, it's going to be so much worse when we actually have to deal with the real economic crisis uh, that is still coming. And What's going to really exacerbate it is that the Federal Reserve still doesn't understand its role in causing that problem. To this day, Ben Bernanke. Okay, so we'll stop it there. So you're predicting, So and the reason you have a track record of being good on predictions, so that's why we're paying attention to this one, uh, you were way out in front of the first economic bubble that I lived through in 2008, uh, collapsing. And, and what is it that the Fed did that now is setting us up for this economic pain happening now. What did they do to handle that uh, collapse? Well, Go ahead. Yeah, well, first of all, you have to understand that the Fed created the problem in the first place, right? They're the ones yes. that kept interest rates at 1%. Mm -hmm. They inflated the housing bubble, and it was all the debt that was accumulated during the housing bubble that resulted in the 2008 financial crisis. So all of this was a byproduct of the Fed under, under Alan Greenspan. Uh, ben Bernanke was there when everything collapsed, but Alan Greenspan was the guy who inflated the bubble, right? Ben Bernanke had just happened to be there when, when everything imploded. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, Greenspan got out of Dodge in the nick of time there and everything fell on, on Bernanke. But what the Fed should have done and what the Bush administration should have done and they didn't do is they should have allowed Wall Street to suffer the consequences of its mistakes. Granted, it made those mistakes based on what the Fed did. I mean, one of the only things that Bush got right, he said Wall Street got drunk, right? And Bush was right, but I always pointed out, yeah, sure, they were drunk, but where'd they get all the alcohol? How'd they get so liquored up, right? That was the Federal Reserve that did that. Now, the government played a role, Fannie and Freddie uh, guaranteeing uh, mortgages, uh, the FDIC guaranteeing bank deposits. So the government created a lot of moral hazard. But the main problem was with the Fed. Now, what the government should have done in 2008, as bad as it would have been, they should have let the collapse happen naturally. They should have let a lot of banks fail, not bail them out. I mean, they let Lehman Brothers fail. They should have let a lot more big banks fail. Uh, they should not have done QE1, QE2. They shouldn't have done TARP. They shouldn't have slashed interest rates uh, <laughs> down to zero. Um, they, they, they should have let the free market fix the mistakes that the government created. That would have been painful. We would have had an even worse recession than the one we had. But then we would have had a real recovery. 
instead of the phony recovery that we ended up having that sowed the seeds of this next crisis. And the way I described the next crisis was going to be the point where the Fed was going to have inflation and recession simultaneously, which is where we're headed. That they were creating so much inflation that eventually it was going to blow up and now the Fed was going to be between a rock and a hard place because so far, every time they fight one of the recessions that they create, they do it by creating inflation. That's what happened. So we created massive inflation following the 2008 financial crisis, and that's how we kicked the can down the road. Well, now, if the Fed raises rates to fight the inflation that we have now, which is so much greater than what we had back then, they will create a worse financial crisis than 2008. But if they then try to bail everybody out like they did in 08 or like they did during COVID in 2020, if they try to go back to QE, well, how do you do that when inflation is still, you know, around 8, 10% or whatever it is, uh, you're going to have a currency crisis. The dollar is going to collapse. Uh, U.S. Treasuries are going to collapse. And then you, you risk uh, runaway inflation. So we're at a point where now where there's no way out. I mean, we've kicked this can down the road so many years that it's now impossible to do it because of the size of the can. And the problems that we have today are enormous compared to what we had in 2008. I mean, we have a much bigger national debt. Uh, the national debt is $31 trillion. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet is $9 trillion. Uh, back then, I mean, it was a fraction of that. Uh, it's because the Fed kept rates so low for so long that there's so much debt. And it's not just the federal government that has all this debt. All the you know, state governments and, and local governments have a lot of debt. Corporations are loaded up with debt. And what did they do with that money? Did they invest in plant and equipment? No, they use it to buy back their overpriced stock. So you have all these levered up corporations. You have Americans you know, levered to the hilt with uh, mortgage debt, student loans, auto loans, credit card debt, no savings, living paycheck to paycheck. This is a gigantic accident waiting to happen. And now, you know, we're in much worse shape than we would have been had we, we actually allowed market forces uh, to work back in 2008, 2009. Uh, you know, now th there's nothing they could do except destroy the dollar. And that's what they're going to do. And that's, we're seeing the beginning of that now with all this inflation. And, you know, they're going to try to blame it on, you know, Putin or uh, greedy businesses. Now Biden today is trying to blame it on the shipping companies. You know, these foreign owned yes. shipping companies are, are, are raising their prices. Of course, they're raising their prices. Their costs are going up. They have no choice. It's, it's a free market they're raising. But, you know, when he make, talks about the fact that they're all foreign, why are they all foreign? Because Americans can't do it because the government imposed such harsh regulations and taxation that there, we have no maritime industry really in the United States. All we, we have, we have no choice but to use foreign ships because they're the only ones that have ships. You know, without foreign ships, there'd be none. So, what, what, so what's going to, if you were Joe Biden and Janet Yellen, uh, by the way, she was one of the people who were saying, that there was no housing bubble, and, and even if housing prices went down, they would be okay. <laughs> Remember that? Exactly. You know, the funny thing about it, when, when uh, Obama nominated her for Fed chairman, he actually congratulated her. He said, hey, Janet Yellen, you were warning everybody about the financial crisis and the housing bubble, and nobody listened to you. I mean, I was thinking, what, what, does he think she's Peter Schiff? Does he think he just nominated Peter Schiff to be on the Secretary of the Treasury? But he talked about all these speeches where Janet Yellen was supposedly warning everybody about the looming uh, financial crisis and the housing bubble. So I was like, really? I don't remember that. So I went back and I, I read her speeches, the very ones that Obama referenced. And what I found was not only did she not warn about the housing bubble, she specifically went out of her way to say the people who were warning about it, they were wrong, that there was nothing to worry about because there was no bubble and that housing prices were going to keep going up. And then she said that, you know, even if I'm wrong and the people who think housing prices are going to go down, even if they're right, it doesn't matter. It's not going to hurt the economy. Yes. The economy is in great shape. Housing is a small part. So she was as clueless as you could be, yet Obama pretended that she was out there warning about it. I did a whole video about this. I made two videos, you know, Janet Yellen exposed. 
and I put them up on YouTube. I did it right when they appointed her because they were all spreading this lie about, you know, how, how, how wise she was, you know, and, and, and how she, if, any, if only people had listened to Janet Yellen. Yeah, we did listen to Janet Yellen. That's the problem. She was completely clueless. And she's still clueless. She's not any smarter now than she was back then. You no, know, she she just had to apologize for being completely wrong about inflation again. And uh, so what did what would I knew inflation was coming? You knew it. And if someone like me knew it, that 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 means that they know it like that. Janet Yellen must have known it. But I so I was speculating the other day on the show that she was lying when she said that inflation wasn't coming. And I said, she's just doing that for political purposes, uh, short term expediency. And they'll they'll deal with the problem when it shows up. Well, it showed up and now they just throw up their hands and go, well, we were wrong. It, what do you make of it? Well, I've always said that, look, they, they're either lying or they're incompetent. Those are the only two choices. And, you know, in general, I think they're lying. Yeah. You know, more than I guess I, it's hard to believe that they're that hard dumb. To Mm-hmm. But yeah. the thing is, why do so many people in the private sector pretend to believe them? Um, but, you know, even now you've got some people, Jamie Dimon is out there saying we've got a financial uh, hurricane coming, economic hurricane. You had uh, Elon Musk say that he's got a really bad feeling about the economy. He wants to lay off 10 percent of uh, the workers at, at Tesla. So some people are starting to point out, hey, th- th- this could be bad. I still think they're sugarcoating it. They have no idea, or even if they have an idea, they don't want to express it because they don't want to be accused of maybe being a fear monger, you know, being, you know, perma bear or chicken little. You know, I don't care if people want to accuse me of that. Uh, I'm just going to tell it like it is. But it's going to be very bad. You know, they're, they're acting like, oh, now we've got this 8% inflation, 9% inflation, the worst, you know, in 40 years. But if we measured inflation, the way we measured it 40 years ago, it's like 15 to 20%. That's what nobody says, that we've completely changed the CPI. So it's not the CPI that they were using in the 70s and 80s. So the comparisons don't mean anything. If you actually adjust for those differences, you know, either inflation in the 70s wasn't 10, 12, 13%, it was only six or seven, in which case we're higher than that now, or you know, it was what it was, and we're you know, 15 to 20 right now, and we're higher than the 70s. But the idea that the Fed can just easily put out this fire, that it's got the tools, no, I mean, it doesn't have the tools. I mean, it has them, but it can't use them because the economy won't be able to withstand it. I mean, Volcker raised interest rates to 20% in 1980, 20%. Now, at the time, inflation was 13 and a half. That was the high point. High CPI inflation was 13 and a half. We have higher than that right now if we use the same CPI as 1980. So how are we going to get rid of inflation with one, two, three percent interest rates? We're not. We need to make inflation, I mean, the interest rate higher than inflation. How are we going to do that? Do you know where mortgage rates were in 1980? I mean, what, 13, 14%? Yeah, what do you think would happen to the U.S. housing market if it cost that much to take out a mortgage? What, I mean, what about all the people that have adjustable rate mortgages? What's going to happen when they reset? Do you think they have any chance no. of making those payments? But what about the federal government? We've got a $31 trillion national debt. What happens if when that debt rolls over? Because every year, about a third of it comes due because it's all short-term borrowing. That's these idiots. They didn't lock in the maturity. It's all an adjustable rate mortgage. It's a gigantic arm that that we're on the hook for. So So if if interest rates go up, where is the government going to get an extra two or three or four trillion per year, per year, to pay the interest on the national debt when that's more than they collect in income taxes in a given year? So now I was always led to believe that our deficits didn't matter because of the petrodollar. But and no one that's this is what I this, so let me just <laughs> so I, that but that does and then that the petrodollar was artificially keeping our dollar strong and inflating it and making it the reserve currency of the world, which and now it seems like It seems to me, someone sitting here doing this show, it seems that Joe Biden, whoever's controlling him, because obviously Joe Biden isn't making any decisions um, because of his mental state. So 
uh, whoever is it, it seems like they're trying to wreck the petrol dollar, which seems to be happening because now Saudi Arabia is letting China buy gas without using dollars. Uh, and so it's going to come to an end. Is that a big deal? Like I've been telling people that's a big deal. That once no, it, the- is a, it is a big deal. So the origin of that concept of the petrodollar. So up until 1971, we had real currency in this, in this country. The Federal Reserve note uh, was backed by gold. So gold was the money. That was the actual money we had. We were on a gold standard. But notes circulated, but they were backed by gold. All the value was derived by gold. The dollar itself was defined by a weight of gold. That's what made a dollar. It was you needed a certain quantity of gold to be a dollar. And so we were on that standard. So in 1971, Nixon took us off that standard because government spending had grown too much and you know we had, we had deficits. And instead of acting fiscally responsible uh, like they should have, uh, they just defaulted and we went off the gold standard. But what Nixon did, because he knew that the dollar had to be backed by something. And so he made this deal with the Saudis that, you know, hey, we're going to protect you from all your enemies. We got this big military. But we need you to do one thing. We need you to price your oil in U.S. dollars and make sure that anybody who wants oil from you pays you in dollars. And and so that created some value for the dollars because people needed dollars to buy oil uh, from Saudi Arabia and everybody else in OPEC. Everybody needs oil. And so everybody needed dollars. And that was convenient for us because that's what we print, right? We printed dollars. But what's happening now is because we're throwing our weight around with all these sanctions and taking extra advantage and exploiting this unique privilege that we have to just print the reserve currency, which means that we don't have to make stuff and we don't have to save. We can just live off everybody else, right? The rest of the world is going to produce stuff and all we have to do is print money. Well, not only did we exploit that with these huge trade deficits, but now we're sanctioning countries, you know, like Russia, you know, hey, if you do something we don't like, uh, you know, we're just going to sanction you. We're going to kick you off of the SWIFT system and we're going to make it hard for you to engage in commerce. That is sending a powerful message to a lot of other nations. Hey, we, we, we got to get out of this system, you know, and now you're seeing more countries, you know, Russia in particular, right? Russia is selling its uh, oil and gas and they're demanding payment in ruble and they're getting paid in ruble. Yeah. And by the way, the ruble is the strongest currency in the world this year. Yeah. It's actually way up on the year. It's much higher than it was when we imposed sanctions. Biden was like so happy when the ruble initially went down. He said that the ruble is turning into rubble. Well, I said it was the dollar that was going to be rubble. And, and now the ruble ha- has gone up. But if the world moves away from accepting dollars, I mean, if you think the price of oil is high now, and by the way, we closed out the week at $120 a barrel, a little bit higher. This is the highest close since just before the 2008 financial crisis. But oil didn't stay at that level for long in 2008. It quickly crashed back down to $30 a barrel. That's not going to happen this time. We're going to keep going up. I think we're going to hit $150 a barrel over the summer, maybe even before the end of this month. But we're going to be there, I think, over the summer. I think by next year, we'll be at $200 a barrel or more. And and so you can add maybe another 50% to um, the price that you're paying for gas at the pump because other factors are going to be pushing that up. So, I mean, I saw some people in California paying as high as $8 a gallon. Over nine already. It's over nine today in Mendocino. Yeah, by next year, we could be looking at $15 at those stations. I'm not even sure if these gas stations, you know, have the capability of having that extra digit. You know, I don't know if if their machines even contemplated gasoline that was over $10 a gallon. So uh, do do they want to uh, do do they want to destroy the dollar because it seems like they're doing that? Well, I don't think the U.S. wants to destroy it. I mean, we'd be complete fools, I, although we may be. But but I don't think we're deliberately destroying the dollar. But that's what's going to happen. That's the natural consequence of what we're doing. I mean, like you know, let's say you're a kid, you know, you're a student, and you know you're you're getting all F's. I mean, it may not be your goal to get all F's. I mean, you'd probably take all A's if the teachers would give you A's. But if you're just not doing your homework, you're cutting class, you're, you know, getting stoned all the time, it's what you're doing that's going to result in F's. It's got nothing to do with what you want. And what America is doing is consistent with failing pretty much every subject. So, yeah, we're going to destroy the value of the dollar. 
But I can understand why our adversaries, why countries like Russia might want to destroy the value of the dollar. I mean, yeah. they might want it to do it as revenge. You know, uh, you know I, I can see other countries. I mean, people would say, why would China want to destroy the value of the dollar? Because, you know, they sell us all this stuff. Right. And if the dollar doesn't have any value, well, then we can't buy their stuff. But we don't actually buy their stuff anyway. They, they just give it to us. They're, it's giant vendor financing. They just they just loan us the money to buy the stuff. But we're never going to pay it back because we have no means of paying it back. All we can do is print more. Uh, but, you know, we keep antagonizing China. And, uh, you know, I think the Chinese uh, would like to see their currency, uh, the, the yuan or the RMB, as the dominant currency in the world. And I do believe that one day it will be, and maybe one day soon, maybe before the end of this decade. Yeah, it seems like it. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, and and it, but it, I know. Well, so if it's weird that if the Biden and the people who are running things right now don't want to, to destroy the dollar, uh, they're doing everything they can to destroy it. That's the weird. Like I can see it again. If I can see it, they must. That's what I don't understand. But well, the one thing they don't want to do is tell the truth to the American public. See, that's the thing. They don't, the, the politicians don't want to, A, fess up to how badly they screwed up over the years because they've screwed up, you know, big time. Right. We're in a lot of trouble. But Biden doesn't want to level with the American public and say, look, we have got an enormous government. We have all these entitlements and they cost a lot of money. And you, the voter, you need to pay for this stuff. You can't have it for nothing. But, you know, the public wants it for nothing. I mean, that's how these politicians get elected. They promise something for nothing. So they don't want to come clean and tell people, look, either we have to cancel all these programs or we have to raise your taxes to pay for them. We're not going to get the money from the billionaires and the millionaires. A, there's not enough of them. And B, they're already paying a lot of taxes. They're not going to pay more. If we raise their taxes, we might actually get less revenue. So... The only room to raise taxes is on the middle class. Although the middle class is broke, I don't think the middle class could afford higher taxes either. So we have to cut government spending. But no politician wants to tell anybody that they have to get less Social Security or less Medicare. And of course, we could also cut the defense budget. But for some reason, nobody wants to cut that. You know, even the Democrats want to keep spending money on defense. And I don't even call it defense. It's offense. You know, it's warfare. We don't even we're wasting so much money uh, and we're actually, I think, compromising our defense. I think we're weaker uh, because we spend so much oh, on defense. I think we'd be no I think we'd be safer if we spent less and we had fewer enemies. <laughs> yeah, you're 100 you're percent right about that. Uh, yes, that's for sure. So, um, yeah, you know, we've been doing the opposite of what. Uh, first of all, let me ask you. So I had a professor on the other day and he said when we had runaway inflation before uh richard nixon and fdr they instituted well fdr instituted rationing and then nixon he said it instituted a price freeze and no and that 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 kind of worked what do you say no, to that what it it doesn't work okay i mean first of all you have to understand inflation is not prices inflation is the money supply that's what's being inflated Right. If you think about the word inflate, what does that word actually mean? Right. It's to expand. Right. Like you inflate a balloon. Right. And so when you inflate a balloon, the balloon doesn't go up. I mean, if you inflate it with helium, it will go up. But when you generally when you take a little balloon and you inflate it, it, it expands. Right. It gets bigger. Right. So how does that apply to inflation if you think inflation is prices? Because prices can't expand. All prices do is they go up and they go down. Right? That's not inflation. Well, it's money supply. You can expand the supply of money by creating more money. You can contract the money supply. So inflation means you expand the money supply. Deflation means you contract the money supply. And if you get an old dictionary, an old Webster's dictionary, that's what it says. That, that's through actual inflation. Now, over time, the government changed the definition of inflation. Why? Well, if you understand what inflation is, an expansion of the money supply, well, you know who causes it. Who controls the money supply? The government, the Federal Reserve. But when you redefine inflation as rising prices, which are a consequence of inflation, when you expand the money supply, prices go up. Now, it's possible that they don't go up, because what if prices were going to fall by uh, 
but you expand the money supply by 10%, and so prices stay the same. You say, oh, there's no inflation. Well, yes, there is, because prices should have gone down 10%. Everybody should have got 10% off, but we didn't. We lost out on that discount because the government created inflation, and we lost the ability to buy stuff uh, at cheaper. But when the government redefined inflation as the consequence and not the act itself, well, now they can blame it on people like Putin, right? Or they can blame it on uh, greedy uh, 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 foreign owners of, of, of uh, transportation, of, of, of ships, right? They can blame it on, uh, you know, greedy uh, labor unions or, you know, any, anybody they want. They can say, oh, it's demanding, you know, it's a wage price spiral or cost push. They can come up with all kinds of excuses now that they've, you know, changed the definition of what inflation is. So, um, but now I forgot your question. So, but, well, let me, uh, let me, I have a different one now. Yeah, but I, I wanted to answer the original, but I had to put it in context. And now I forgot. Um, I, I forgot what, what I, I don't know. We, you, you asked me something about, <laughs> about prices. And inflation. <laughs> no, I did, didn't. I ask you if Nixon and, and and oh yeah, yeah. Now I remember. Okay, so here's why price controls don't work because you are attacking the symptom and not the disease. It's like if you have skin cancer and the doctor says, "Well, how about let's put a band aid on it so you don't see the cancer?" Right. Well, uh, what good is that? I mean, you haven't treated it. You're just trying to cover it up. And so if you just try to freeze prices. You're not getting to the core of why prices are going up. You're just trying to stop the symptom of the inflation, which is the increase in price. So what happens when the government puts a price control and says you can't raise prices? Well, you get shortages because now the price is artificially low. So a lot of people want to buy it, um, and, but there's not enough there. The, 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 the producers don't want to sell it because the, it's not a high enough price. But the, the buyers want to keep buying it because they're getting a great deal. So you get a shortage. And now you have to start rationing stuff because prices are the market's way of rationing, right? You set an actual price where supply and demand meet, and then there's no shortages. There's no long lines. You're, you know, the price you know, is discovered by the market and supply and demand are in equilibrium. But when the government puts a, a ceiling on the price, it's out of equilibrium. You get a lot more demand than you have supply. And now you have long lines, you know, and, and shortages and rationing and all that stuff. But then what ends up happening is you get a black market. Because let's say the government says, okay, you know, uh, the price of, of, of an item, let's say a widget, they say the widgets are going to be $5. Well, you know, what if it costs, you know, $10 to make a widget? So you can't actually buy one legally, but people still want them. So maybe there's a black market where you can buy one illegally for $15 or $20. Uh, but now, you know, you're buying it, you know, from a criminal. And, you know, he's got to charge an even higher premium because he's risking going to jail. And maybe you risk going to jail, even buying it. Uh, but you need it and you really want it. And so you get this illegal black market that develops in order for people to get around the price controls. And, you know, they had they had all kinds of fancy ways they got around it in the 70s. Like, you know, they would come up with new like new cuts of meat that, you know, nobody heard of. So, oh, it didn't exist before. So we could put a, a whole new price on it because now it's a brand new product. You know, so they would have to come out with things or that's when, you know, when they had those controls, wage and price controls, that's when the labor unions wanted their health insurance as part of their pay because they couldn't get higher pay. So they said, OK, just cover our health insurance. You know, we want health insurance. You know, because there's a way to get around uh, the, wage, the, the wage controls. But all kinds of distortions happen. But eventually, the government has to give up, and they take away the controls. And now prices go way up. It's like, you know, you finally take the Band-Aid off your skin cancer, and then you notice how much worse it is, right? Because you didn't do anything while you had a Band-Aid on it. Uh, and maybe you kept doing things that, that made it worse. And that's what happens when the government puts uh, price controls and keeps printing money, it keeps creating inflation, and it's going after the symptoms, you know, and not the cause, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And so what, tell me two things, what should the government be doing now to fix this? And what can individuals do to insulate themselves from the hurricane uh, that Jamie Dimon says is coming? Well, I think it's actually gonna be a lot worse than the one Dimon is warning about. 
Um, but what you have to do as an individual is recognize <clears throat> that inflation is going to destroy the value of your savings, of your paycheck. That's what it does. It, it's like a tax that you're paying because right. the government is financing its spending through inflation. And that tax hits you if you have dollars, if you earn dollars. And so how do you avoid that tax as best you can? And that is don't hold dollars. Get rid of them as soon as they come into your possession. And so you have two things that you can do with those dollars. You can go out and spend them on stuff, right, that you may need. And I've been telling people for years, and this advice has been pretty good. I was telling people, you know, a couple of years ago to just stock up, to just fill up their, their closets with stuff, you know, stuff that wouldn't perish, you know, like go, you know, for your bathroom, get your toothpaste, your deodorant, your shaving cream, your razor blades, you know, mouthwash, whatever you think you need, dental floss, just get it all because it's just going to go way up in price and you might as well buy it now. I mean, you know, you're going to use it eventually. So if I can buy something today for a dollar, then in a few years is going to be $5. I mean, I made four times my money, five times my money. I mean, it's hard to do that in the stock market. You could do it in, you know, with your uh, medicine cabinet, but at least you're getting stuff that you know you're going to use. And I said the same thing about, you know, uh, toiletries. I mean, uh, like detergents or uh, toilet paper, uh, stuff like that you could store. But then food, you can food or food that you could freeze. I mean, look at how much everything costs. Look at box of cereal today, I mean, compared to what it was a year ago. So anybody who just loaded up on stuff has a great return on that. You don't want to save. I mean, there are people now that go shopping um, every week as they need stuff. Oh, better off go shopping for months in advance because everything is going to be more expensive every time you go back to the store. Um, but, you know, if you've got millions of dollars, I mean, that doesn't work. I mean, if you're the typical family, you know, just saving a little bit of money, yeah, you do that. Don't save any money, just save stuff because the stuff has real value. But if you're, you know, more substantial, you've got hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, I mean, there's only so much deodorant you can buy, right? I mean, how much are you going to need? I mean, maybe you could even barter it in the future for things that you need, but there's a limit to how much. So now you have to start investing your money. Well, you got to invest your money out of the dollar. So you can't hold any bonds that are in dollars. That's where you'll get completely destroyed. So you don't want to own uh, treasuries, muni bonds, corporate bonds. I mean, you're going to get killed if you own any of those things. They're not safe. They're extremely risky because that is what gets hit by inflation because the value of the principal gets destroyed through inflation. Uh, so you don't want any bonds. You don't want like a CD. That's really a certificate of depreciation. That's all you're getting is depreciating currency. So you got to own things or stocks, but I don't like most U.S. stocks because they're too expensive. Um, they're overpriced and the U.S. economy is a disaster. So that's going to be very bad for a lot of these U.S. companies. So I think it's going to be bad for the stockholders. So what I'm doing personally, what I've been doing and what I advise my clients to do, or my, anybody who's listening to this, is invest in a quality portfolio of dividend-paying foreign stocks, good companies, equity, uh, you know, telecom uh, companies, um, you know, uh, natural resource like oil and gas or agriculture, tobacco, pharmaceutical, uh, you know, uh, buying property trusts. Um, utilities in countries that I think are in better relative shape. I mean, no one's in great shape. It's all a question of which countries are in the least bad shape. But I want to buy real assets uh, where companies are selling products that people need and that people will pay higher prices to get. Maybe they'll, they'll reduce how much they buy, but they'll never eliminate it. You don't want to own stock in companies that are selling stuff that people want because they can eliminate that. They have to buy what they need. They can give up what they want in order to afford what they need. And more and more people are going to be giving stuff up. And so I want to invest in the companies that are going to sell the stuff that people have to buy and they can charge higher prices and, and pay me higher dividends. Uh, but I, and I also own a lot of resources that are going to benefit from inflation. I want to, I want to own the companies that have those resources 
whether it's energy, oil and gas, uh, uh, industrial materials, uh, metals, including precious metals, but industrial metals, agriculture companies. I, I want to own those businesses. These are not the kind of businesses that most people have been investing in. They've been buying tech stocks, you know, momentum stocks, meme stocks. All that crap is going to collapse. All that stuff is overpriced. It was part of the bubble and all that's going to go down. So you don't want to be invested in those bubble stocks when the air is coming out of the bubble. You want to you want to invest in the type of stocks that do well in an inflationary environment, not the, the environment we had before, which was when they pretended there was no inflation and we had very low interest rates, zero percent rates. Rates are going up, but inflation is going up even more. And that's a very different investment landscape. But I do think people will make a lot of money if they get this right, because I think that you have resources that are mispriced. I think investments are mispriced to reflect the fact that so few people seem to really understand what's going on and what's going to happen. Just like, you know, uh, during the, the uh, housing bubble, when I was initially, you know, shorting subprime and these subprime mortgages, and they, they had this one tranche uh, of these uh, collateralized mortgage obligations that was rated triple B. It was the, 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 the lowest tier and it took all of the losses of the portfolio first before any you know, other tranches had to deal with losses. And so when I first learned about these securities, in my mind, they were worthless. I said, how can anybody buy these? They're going to get completely wiped out. Uh, yet investors were buying them and you know, uh, the, the credit agencies were rating them. Uh, and it should have been obvious that they were worthless, but it wasn't obvious. But they were worthless and they went to zero very quickly uh, once people recognized what they own. But for a while, there was an opportunity uh, to sell something that was dramatically overpriced because, you know, the vast majority of investors were clueless. Well, they're still clueless. They don't understand inflation. They don't understand what's going to happen. And so prices of assets do not reflect what's going to happen. They reflect what a bunch of fools think is going to happen. But when you know that these fools are wrong, you can invest for what actually is going to happen. And because so many people don't understand that, you could do it at very favorable prices. And so I think that not only will investors who do the right thing protect their wealth from inflation, they'll actually increase their wealth. And that's what I'm helping people do. So here, maybe hopefully you can help answer this question. I've asked several people this. I haven't gotten a satisfactory answer. So can you repeat? I, I'm having a pro my no earpiece problem. is just not, it keeps coming unplugged. I got to get this fixed. So all I right. travel all around the country and I stay at hotels, three or four hotels a week. And I notice that they don't have room service. They don't have breakfast service. They don't have maid service. Mm -hmm. And they say there's a labor shortage. And I'm like, well, where did all these people, did they all get on a ship and go to another country and start working? Of course, they're still here. How could there be a labor shortage? And <laughs> what I'm told, so I always thought the way capitalism worked was if the demand is uh, high for something and the supply is low, the price goes up. So... Uh, for instance, I, I know people who own restaurants, right? And so a guy just reopened a restaurant and was closed during COVID, and he's only going to open at half capacity. And I said, why? He says, because I can't get kitchen help. He he has 200 people wanting to buy a hamburger, but he can only service 100 of those people because he can't hire more kitchen staff. And I'm like, well, did you raise your wage for your kitchen staff so you could attract more? And no, no they'll never do that. And I'm well, like- the reason the reason they're not doing it is because if they did that, the, their customers couldn't afford to, to buy the product. See, they're trying to figure out how not to raise prices to such a degree that they won't lose their customers. So what they're doing is they're cutting back on the service. And that's interesting because, you know, the government always likes to lie and, you know, they, they adjust prices because they, they claim that stuff gets better. So let's say the price of something goes up by 20%. The government, when they do the CPI, they may say, well, it didn't go up by 20%. It went down by 5% because it's 25% better. They'll, they'll try to claim that the product has been improved somehow. You know, it's faster. It's, you know, whatever it is. And they, they, they call it hedonics. But they never seem to adjust for quality degradation. You know, when you get less, uh, like, you know, they'll measure, oh, how much does it cost to buy an airline ticket? And they'll compare that. It's like, well, yeah, but... When I used to buy an airline ticket, my check luggage was included. I got a meal included. I got a pillow. I got a blanket if I wanted one. That was all included. Now, everything is extra. 
Oh, you want to check bags? Oh, it's extra. Oh, you want to pick your seat? That's extra. You want a meal? That's extra, right? You want a pillow? You got to pay for that too, right? You got to pay for everything. Yet, so, but they just compare the actual price of the ticket without looking at the quality. So now you go to a hotel and, oh, you want maid service? Well, that costs extra. You know, that used to be included. You check, you bought, you got into a hotel. It meant that somebody, you know, cleaned your sheets and, you know, washed the bathroom. Now it's like, oh, you want that? That's going to cost more. But yeah, all these people who claim there's a labor shortage, there's only a labor shortage because they're not paying enough, right? But why aren't they paying more? Because the customers can't afford it because they have to make a profit. So if they had to staff up and they had to pay their workers what their workers want in order to come take these jobs, they'd have to raise the price so much that they lose, they might go out of business. So they're, so, they're, they're trying to survive. So I was so, okay, that's what I was told uh, also, that that's the, that, and that, that was the situation uh, right up before FDR came in, that these people were stuck. They couldn't hire people because they needed to raise their wages, but they couldn't raise the price of their thing because people didn't have money in their pocket because the income inequality was so high back then. Well, actually, it was the opposite. I mean, wages wages during the Depression area, they were going to come down. And the government kind of, this is before Roosevelt, this is Hoover. And Hoover was encouraging companies not to reduce wages. But they needed to reduce wages because prices were falling. Had they reduced wages, the workers would have been fine because everything they needed to buy also became cheaper. But by not cutting wages, effectively wages were going up. So what companies had to do during the 1930s, early in the 30s, because, Roose because Hoover convinced everybody not to cut wages, so they laid people off instead. That was the only way they could survive. You know? But we would have been better off had they just reduced everybody's wages. Because prices dropped by 30 or 40 percent during the Depression. So if your wages stayed the same, that was like a 30 to 40 percent raise. You know, why not let the wages go down 30 or 40 percent? If all the prices went down 30 or 40 percent, everybody, you know, would be the same. Uh, and then nobody would have been fired. But wages were kept artificially high early in the Depression. And, that, and, and the result was a big increase in unemployment. Well, I wish we had more time to talk, and I really appreciate you making time today. So thank you very much. My theory of, of the of, of part of what's happening right now was the mismanagement of the CARES Act. And what they did was they just gave $5 trillion to the richest thousand people in the country. It's what it looked like to me. And, uh, of course, you're going to get inflation after you inject $5 trillion in cash. That, that whole thing was a disaster. Remember, it started under Trump, uh, the Paycheck Protection uh, all these bailouts for businesses. I said from the beginning, it was just a slush fund. Uh, everybody was going to take all this money. It was it was the biggest fraud, uh, massive giveaway uh, of, of money out of thin air. It was a huge mistake. So unfortunately, the Republicans established the precedent for that mistake. Uh, Biden just you know continued it uh, as president. But you, it's hard to just blame Biden for just doing again what Trump did. Right. Uh, but it wasn't just Trump. All the Democrats signed on to it. Yes. Everybody wanted to give away money uh, during COVID. Uh, it was the, an asinine policy. Uh, and we're going to be paying for that uh, for years and years to come uh, for, for, for those mistakes. I mean, that's, that's a big reason why we have this inflation. But it, it started long before then. I mean, we're dealing with the mistakes that go back to QE1, not just the QE4 that we did after COVID. Uh, so we have so much inflation in this pipeline. That's why this is just the tip of the iceberg. What we've experienced so far is just a small taste of, of, what, of what we're going to have to swallow when it comes to uh, higher prices. So uh, what do you, if they would have just taken that $5 trillion I know you'll probably disagree with this, but instead of giving it to the richest people in the country and bailing out airlines, uh, they which they you know, and then they use that money to buy stock. But anyway, if they would have put that money in people's pockets, it would have been much better of us. I mean, they no, I know, I know you're gonna disagree. I know you were disagree. It's okay. Well, first of all, remember <laughs> the government doesn't have any money to give, right? It, it 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 prints it, but then what happens when the government creates new money? It destroys the value of the money that already exists. See, money itself, paper money, has no actual value. 
right? You can't do anything with it. You can just use it to buy something else, but that something else needs to be produced. The government doesn't produce anything. So all it does is create money that you can use to buy stuff. But if the stuff isn't there to buy, all that happens is prices go up. Right. And that's what's happened. And so you can't look to the government to support the people. The government can't support the people. It's the other way around. The people have to support the government. The government can't give us anything. It takes from the public. And so what, what the government should have done on, under COVID is nothing. They, could have, they should have cut government spending is what they should have done. They should have eased the burden of government on the economy, realizing that the economy was dealing with the burden of the pandemic, so it needed uh, you know, less government. And the Federal Reserve should have recognized the, the, the inflationary aspects of the pandemic, and they should have said, we need to start withdrawing some money from circulation because the economy is going to contract. We're not producing enough goods. We need to reduce the supply of money to stabilize the price of goods. They didn't do that. They did the opposite. They increased the supply of money as we were decreasing the supply of goods. The, the complete gonna, opposite of what should have been done. And that's, and in the, fact, that's the recipe for inflation. Yeah. And if you look back to the origins of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, the Federal Reserve was created specifically to provide an elastic money supply. And that meant a money supply that expanded when the economy expanded and then contracted when the economy contracted. The Federal Reserve did the opposite of what it was created to do. OK. Uh, Peter Schiff, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, everybody check out Peter Schiff's show and uh, I hope you'll come back soon. Sure thing. Okay, take care. Here we're doing stand-up comedy in Irvine, California, Las Vegas, San Diego, Salt Lake City, Indianapolis, Louisville, all over the place. Go to jimmydorkcomedy.com for a link for tickets.